show. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jean Marie Procious. I'm the executive director of the Salem Athenaeum. We're delighted to have Megan Marshall and Lloyd Schwartz with us this evening. Before we get started, I would like to invite you to join us for upcoming programs, including this coming Monday, when Skip Finley will be talking about his new book, Whaling Captains of Color. And again, on February 11th, we'll have a panel discussion entitled Reckoning with Racist Monuments, part of a new year-long series where we will be examining the legacy of systemic racism. And now it's my pleasure to invite Blake Campbell to introduce our speakers. Blake is an Athenaeum member and serves on our Writers Committee. He also facilitates our Monday Writers Group. Blake? Um, thank you, Jean Marie. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here um, tonight um, to honor Scott and his poetry. I first met Scott Harney at Porter Square Books in early 2017 at an event for his partner, Megan Marshall's biography, Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast. I knew that he and Megan had met in Robert Lowell's class at Harvard and Lowell became a frequent topic of conversation between us. I was never able to work up the courage to ask Scott to do his Robert Lowell impression for me, which Megan had much praised, but Scott was generous with his recollections of his teacher. Scott also encouraged my poetry while remaining characteristically reticent about his own. As Megan says in her introduction to his book, Scott didn't talk about his writing, he just did it. It wasn't until after his death in May 2019 that I came to understand his profound dedication to the art. Scott was someone who wrote because he had to, and he left behind a remarkable body of work, almost all of it unpublished. Though I wish I had had time to talk to him about the poems collected in the blood of San Gennaro, the book that Megan and Lloyd will be reading from tonight, I'm grateful for the literary afterlife he has enjoyed since its publication. Last summer, I wrote a short review of Scott's book for the literary journal Molecule, which I'll read in full by way of introducing his poetry. But first, our presenters. Megan Marshall is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of biographies of Elizabeth Bishop, Margaret Fuller, and the three Peabody sisters. She is the Charles Wesley Emerson Professor at Emerson College, where she teaches in the MFA Creative Writing Program. Most recently, she is the editor of her late partner Scott Harney's posthumously published book of poems, The Blood of San Gennaro, on which she will speak at this event. Born in Brooklyn, poet and Elizabeth Bishop scholar Lloyd Schwartz is Frederick S. Troy Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts in Boston and Poet Laureate of Somerville. His collections of poetry include Little Kisses, Cairo Traffic, Goodnight Gracie, and These People. Schwartz is the editor of Prose, Elizabeth Bishop, and co-editor of Elizabeth Bishop and her art and of the Library of America's Elizabeth Bishop Poems, Prose, and Letters. Schwartz's additional honors include a Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, and a 2019 Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship in Poetry. I love this life because there is no other, Scott Harney writes in his first and posthumous book, for all their flirtation with transcendence, these luminous poems never relinquish their foothold on the physical world. Turning from them, to quote Scott, we can face the bright flat wash of just another day. And now I'll turn it over to the presenters. Thank you, Blake. Thank you. Just a wonderful introduction, giving a sense of Scott's poems and um, and thank you, Lloyd, for, for being here with me to share this reading. Um, My pleasure. I think we're gonna trade off uh, reading uh, about nine or 10 poems, and then we'll have some questions and uh, maybe I'll add a little reading from prose to close if there's time. Um, and uh, I also wanna start by thanking um, Aerosmith Press, Oskold Melnichuk and Ezra Fox who made this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, 
I'm so grateful to them. And I'm also really grateful to the Salem Athenaeum for hosting us. Salem was a, a place that um, Scott and I did spend a fair amount of time. He liked to quote a line from Robert Lowell's poem in, called Hawthorne in uh, For the Union Dead about, he said, the line is, you'll wander uh, to no purpose in Hawthorne's Salem. And I think um, <laughs> Scott would have liked to have more opportunity to just ramble about in Hawthorne's Salem than, than we ever did. Usually we're coming up for readings. I remember particularly one that was hosted by Berkeley and Josie Peabody in the very house in which um, the uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne met the Peabody sisters right next to the uh, Charter Street graveyard where uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's um, hanging judge, John Hawthorne, is buried just outside the window of the Peabody's front parlor where they, they all met. So um, there are many great memories of Salem that I have that include Scott. And so it's particularly appropriate to be reading here. Um, I thought I'd begin with a poem that in some ways is uh, a key to this whole collection. Um, Dreaming Under Ether. This was a poem um, that I didn't know existed at all, as is true of many of the poems in the book. Um, as Blake said, I met Scott in Robert Lowell's poetry workshop. We were, um, it was probably another 30 years after that before we remet and became involved. And there was a lot I didn't know about what was going on in those 30 years. I particularly, I didn't know about the poetry that he was writing. Um, after he died, he had left me a list of a few people to contact uh, to let them know of his death. And one was Michelle Secord, who had been his girlfriend for a few years after college. And they remained friends uh, through all that time. I had never met her. Um, I let her know about Scott's death. And um, I thought I wanted to give her something. Next to Scott's bed was a bookcase. And on this bookcase were a number of sort of relics, one of which was a antique glass bottle that said spirit nitrous ether on it. And it was, um, it was from a, a pharmacy in Portland, Maine where Michelle lives. So I thought I was heading through Portland for something. We'd stop and I would give her this bottle and be something for her to remember him by. And I think it was precious to him, maybe in his illness, a kind of thought of some kind of, um, you know, cure, the nitrous ether spirits. Um, so I handed this to Michelle. We had a nice conversation. She didn't say anything at the time, except that she thought she knew where he'd found this in a, um, in a shop near near where she lived in Portland that he liked to frequent, an antique bottle shop. And then I got home from my little trip north and she had sent me um, a PDF, a copy of a poem called this, this very poem, um, Dreaming Under Ether, that I didn't know existed. Um, Scott had left about 16 poems for me, the, the, the poems in the first part of the book. I knew about those, but I didn't know there were others that, that were so great as this. And um, this led to a correspondence with Michelle, which led to my finding more and more poems. So I thought I'd read this Dreaming Under Ether because the thing that was startling about it, um, Scott had talked about all the things that happened in this poem, but he'd never told me there was a poem about it. Hmm. Um, and just before I read, I'll say another thing that I found in my process of, of investigating Scott's archives was a, a letter in which he'd written to a friend. This was just in shortly after college, but he was a very avid poet then. He said, what still lives inside me that doesn't live in a poem? And uh, so I knew that the memories that lived inside him were probably most of them going to show up in poems. And I found many such poems. So Dreaming Under Ether, it calls on, uh, he told me that he was born with his tear ducts blocked. And as a little boy, he'd been sent, taken to the doctor who under anesthesia or ether of some sort, um, tried to work away at the, the tear duct so that he could, he could cry as anyone would um, freely. There are tears <laughs> in other poems. Um, it also, uh, he had a kind of passion for a movie called Invaders from Mars um, that he'd seen as a little boy. Maybe some of you have seen that. Um, and that comes up here too. And I, you know, he had a DVD of the movie, but 
So this is a, kind of a message in a bottle to me, this poem, Dreaming Under Ether. I entered the antique bottle shop filled with the thousand shapes of emptiness the vapors of whiskey and ancient oils, ghosts of old perfumes. In drifts of dust, the uncorked bottle labeled spirits, nitrous ether, brought to mind how I was born with tear ducts closed, the childhood trips to Doc MacGyver, who put me under and tried to pry them open. I recalled the dreaming under ether, my lettered blocks against a fiery spiral, Buster Brown and Tag jumping from block to block to spell some forgotten word. Despite the doctor's order that I fast, I once sneaked toast and woke to the taste of vomit, a humming nurse brushing my slack mouth clean. At home, I dreamed those figures in robes of aquamarine surrounding my narrow bed the dull glare hovering like a ship from Mars, and finally the soaked cloth muzzle coming down. That was the nightmare I shared with my nation. Invaders from Mars or Russia would dope us with blind purpose, and we'd rise from TV's enlightenment, stray too far beyond our backyards, into the deep fields, the air a thick mist of ether. And we'd walk aimless, forever, searching for a word, a tiny opening, hearing far off the nurse's tune. So there we are. It's kind of an ominous poem, I think. <laughs> but um, one of the things that Scott uh, appreciated about the confessional uh, turn in poetry that he followed was the way uh, one's own life could reverberate with the politics of the time and you see that a lot in his poems so I'll let Lloyd go on with a, a next poem. Well I thought I might mention um, uh, meeting Scott and how I got to know his poems. Um, I think I had heard about Scott because Megan and I had been friends for some years um, and I'd heard that there was a new, wonderful new person in her life. And I believe I met this wonderful new person in the aisle at Emmanuel Church at a concert <laughs> that we had all that we had all been to together. And I was, um, and I I liked this new person, and I uh, hoped for the best. Um, and then. Um, we would run into each other from time to time. And then a, a, at least a couple of years later, um, I got an invitation to um, a kind of dinner party uh, at which Scott was going to read some of his poems uh, by a mutual friend of uh, Megan's and, 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 and mine, Susan Quinn and, and her husband, Dan Jacobs, invited people over to hear um, to have dinner and hear and hear Scott read. I think some of the people in the audience, at least two people in the audience tonight, were at that event, uh, Gail and David. Um, and um, and I and I thought I have to admit I thought to myself, mm, the boyfriend of a very good writer is going to read his poems tonight. And I thought, well, I, I, I want to be a good friend and I will um, try to keep an open mind about, uh, about the poems because I frankly didn't expect much uh, from an amateur poet. And then Scott read, and this is one of the poems he read. And I think I and everyone else who was there who did not know his poems uh, was just completely blown away. And he was, he was the real thing and uh, a wonderful poet. And um, I have been a fan uh, ever since then. So this uh, Scott, uh, I don't know, Megan, do you want to 
talk about Scott spent a lot of time in Naples. And uh, the first poem I'm going to read is 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 takes place in that in that part of the world. So maybe I should read the poem first, and then yeah, I'll, we can talk about Naples later on. So okay, uh, yeah. Good. So this is called climbing Mount Vesuvius. Not the mythic hike you might imagine, nymphs and satyrs flitting about the steamy slopes, a distant hiss of orange lava just about to spill over the crater's edge. Not the grand tour trip via funicular, ladies fanning off volcanic dust as the tram groans to the cone. Just a ride by air-conditioned bus through the slanted suburbs at the base, up through fields of weeds, clotted with tar from a recent eruption. Perhaps that spurt in 44, a fart in the face of packing fascists. Halfway up, we stop at a souvenir shop where Gregorio, his hair ash white beneath a black leather cap, explains in several languages that he alone is the keeper of Vesuvius and will sell you glossy books of hot red shots. For nothing more, he'll sign the flyleaf, adding a sketch of his charge, the smoking mountain on the bay, the usual view from Posilipo. The driver checks his watch. Perhaps he hears a distant rumble that signals magma rising, enough to melt down half of Naples. Or perhaps his stomach says it's time for lunch. He drops us near the summit for the last ascent, by the parking lot and toilets, snack bar, and more stuff for sale, necklaces of lava, and a wine called Tears of Christ. I came to see the fires of hell and find instead a rest stop on the way to heaven. But up ahead, a wide path rises, filled with pilgrims streaming toward the rim. And so I follow, the sky spreading wider over my head and land now falling away, the crater on one side the sudden sea on the other, the way between forever narrowing. The great abyss today is just a gravel pit with a few small fissures letting off steam, but still no place for a picnic. Just stay steady for the walk ahead to a shack on the narrowest edge where they sell limoncello for a euro a shot. And you sway between the crater and the rest of the world, deciding where to fall. Thank you, Lloyd. Um, my daughter Josie made a collection of Scott's Italian poems um, and published them in a little, I guess not quite a chapbook, but she took that phrase from the last line to use as the title of the of her little book um, between the crater and the rest of the world it's a wonderful wonderful line yeah. um, well i want to shift back to uh scott's childhood recollections in a poem that's called revere beach um, and i want to read this in honor of scott's mother who died uh, a month ago at age almost 92. Um, they were very close and you get a sense of that closeness in this poem, uh, which I'm sure they were close from the beginning, but uh, when his uh, dad left them all when Scott was age 10 and the family moved uh, to Charlestown where his mother had grown up, um, that made Scott the, the man of the house at age 10. And, and you get a feeling of that in this poem, which is about um, a, a summer day at Revere Beach, which was the closest um, beach 
now to where the family was living and um, kind of an adventure for him to go there having been a suburban kid for much of his life until then. Um, he had a fascination with the history of the places that he lived and cared about and, and the history that went along with his mother's life as well. So you'll hear in this poem um, a bit about her boyfriend, Earl Dane, who takes her on a motorcycle ride, as well as um, the uh, looming, or I don't know, the you don't loom if you're underwater, the submarines, the German submarines that were uh, patrolling uh, the Atlantic coast. And in fact, in the early 1940s during the war, um, uh, mining Boston Harbor and blowing up ships. And it, it was a, a dangerous time. And so I guess the, the sense of danger, separation, um, anyway, that, that overshadows this, this poem, which also though has one of my other favorite lines. Um, and it also mentions, I, many of you probably know about red dye number three. It was a substance that was used to dye things like marish, maraschino cherries and those little red hot candies. Um, and around 1990, which is I think around the time this poem was written, it was banned as carcinogenic. So that comes up in here. Revere Beach. Gulls aloft, father lost, mother and son burn on the beach. Behind us, motorcycles rumbled like distant thunder on the boulevard. Before us, the sun welded ocean to sky, and I was ten. But mother, watch the huge waves still rush in, collapse as they claw the sand. Watch me ride them in without a surfboard or a destroyer, whipped by the tail of yesterday's storm to fall just short of the seawall, my belly raw from landing on sand, gravel, bits of glass. And so went the afternoon until the lifeguard whistled me out and sent me down to safer surf in the shade of the cyclone roller coaster, the dodgem cars, the houses of horror and clams. I watched the cotton candy blow and spin together, the pink cloud forming itself like the first whim of creation. The second whim is to become unspun, return to sugar, water, elements that matter, including red dye number three. During the war, you rode the thunder on the back of Earl Dane's Harley followed by German submarines up and down the shore, your lipstick blurred in the misted crosshairs. But Sunday read your class another story from the children's Bible, pointing to the watercolors on every other page, still in my mind, the colors of biblical times, the lavender wash of the Samaritan's robe, the smoky cobalt of the sky over Calvary. Jesus, Jesus loved us, yes we knew, mother, Close your eyes against the tide and sleep. I'll watch for submarines. So now maybe Lloyd will carry on with a poem of local local interest too. Yeah, this is um, uh, this is a, a I, it's really a, it's a love poem, but in some way it's also a love poem to Somerville, and uh, I, I think it has some of the most uh, beautiful descriptions I know of um, of uh, place that I live in. Uh, it's called Somerville and Farther North. We drive a mile past the homes of men and engines, beneath a low-slung evening sky to Union Square, slide to third and Somerville suddenly opens like a night blooming flower. Streets are black petals that draw the humming traffic in like bees to a center of street lamp stamens, exhaust will pollinate. Incongruent dreams on a barren landscape, yet how else defy the sadness of a sooty moon? As dawn exposes the incandescent bluish maroon of roses you brought two weeks ago, I question nothing. Let light decide the shapes 
and colors of this fuzzy room. Let the music of your breathing entertain an audience of hopes, regrets, facts, and lies until the critics put their pencils down and listen. Witnessed by the amber water glasses of a hired hall, we danced to Crosby and Sinatra. I swear to disbelieving friends, yes, it was just that simple. When afternoon departs and follows a bitter derelict down Broadway, you laugh at my weakest jokes and choose to believe only what I'm least sure of. 40 miles north, the day after my first night away from you, an arrowhead of geese speeds overhead, following their own direction, honking, determined, stretching their long necks south. And I think I'm gonna read another poem of, uh, of some local interest. Um, Scott had a very sly sense of humor, and I I love when his um, when his playfulness uh, gets into his poems, inf infiltrates his poems, and it's 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 it, this is really one of my favorite uh, of Scott's titles. Um, it's called "Working in Pajamas." Not for the promise of making thousands at home in my spare time, but for a wage just above minimum. I worked once in pajamas, not dressed in such, but selling them on the first floor of Filene's department store. From the counter I manned like an ancient ship, I could see men's socks across the bay hung like fish in a harbor market. To starboard, men's hats were on display, including the one for which I longed, a cap of leather lined with rabbit, as worn by flyers in high cold places beyond my reach, as was the price, even with the discount granted to employees so you could give them back your pay. Today, I am a man of influence and means. So now own two as the earth turns warmer. But back to my pajamas. These were the dying days of polyester. So I held out silks and the finest cottons to the ladies who, yes, did most of the buying. But they refused to return to their irons and pushed these weaves away for the holy blend of 6040, even after I delicately questioned the point of ironing pajamas at all. One day, a junior buyer emerged from the stockroom with the king of sleepwear, the lord of loungewear, the god of bachelor attire a velvet smoking jacket, burgundy trimmed with shiny black piping, lined with navy acetate, tailored in Hong Kong before the rest of China freed itself to slave for the first world. Like a court couturier, he dressed a headless torso in the jacket made famous by movie stars and a pornographer whose name will not matter to you readers of future centuries. And so I wondered with my colleagues on other days and shifts, who would buy this? What rich bastard, sugar mama or celebrity would pay the price so high it made the register add in a tax for luxury, which I knew of only from the game Monopoly. And of course, you know the rest. A man in rags showed up 
and paid in cash to walk out with the jacket in a gift box under his arm, whistling. What you don't know is this man wore the jacket only when alone to look at photos of his wife dead for 14 years. This morning, I am working in pajamas with little time to spare. The sea outside my window calling me to sail far out to unknown lands beyond myself or deeper toward those inner harbors also never seen. And whether you work or don't, in Italian suits or pajamas, a gull still labors on against the salty spit and wind that never ends. Mm. Thank you, Lloyd. Wow. Um. I, I love the way that his humor and his seriousness really coincide. They're both very much part of, of Scott's character mm -hmm. and of, his, of, of, of who he was. And um, there's a, it, it's amazing to have, to be able to pull that off in, in, in a poem. Um, and it's so, it's both so moving, but it's also very funny some of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, the poem I'm going to read, um, it's also about the territory that Scott knew so well um, that Charlestown and Everett, it's, this is in Everett, um, Revere, Somerville. Um, and it's a retrospective poem, but from the point of, um, it was written shortly after 9-11. It's kind of a 9-11 poem, uh, although very much a personal one and also refers to the end of his marriage, which was a short marriage at the end of a 12 year relationship. Um, but it also has that, you know, almost, uh, almost comic um, level of detail that, um, you know, really makes you focus in on, on the moment, on the feelings by way of, of things. Um, and uh, so anyway, I, I'm just going to read one of my favorite poems, Smokestack and Steeple. And although it's a 9-11 era poem, um, I think it still speaks for today. Smokestack and Steeple. I live here on this hill. This is uh, up in Everett, looking back towards the city of Boston. I live here on this hill where first I came after the divorce, the first year spent talking to her as if she were there, loading the dishwasher the way she liked. Waiting for the bus one morning that year, I saw them rising at different distances, but next to each other on the near horizon, a power plant smokestack and the Gothic steeple of the Church of the Immaculate Conception. I could have cursed and spoken the truth that smokestack and steeple both spew forth intoxicating filth to make us slaves to hope and industry. But instead, each day I bowed my head, for these were my own twin towers no one would aim for, diffusing the bomb I strapped on each day, set for the hour of need. Down below, beyond the end of Broadway, after that stretch of Route 99, rutted and ruptured as the road to Verdun, I could stand on the old low bridge where men and boys fish for anything that might still swim. I could watch the river yawn in the face of the ocean, the freighters ache from what they carry, and the chalk green girders of the great high bridge do nothing more than the old low one connect dead shores, like my dreams of the past, carry the usual traffic that believes it has somewhere to go. But from this hill, the view is clear, at least when the haze gives way. 
Though prayers each day go up in smoke, our stung eyes climb each chimney and spire and search for a sky that could almost care. Um, so that poem, I, I guess, you know, maybe half the poems we've read are in the collection of 16 that Scott left for me to try to do something with. Mercifully, Oskold Melnicek had attended that reading at Sue Quinn's and uh, remembered it and asked right away um, to publish what we thought would be a chapbook of those 16 poems. But as I said, Michelle um, sent me Dreaming Under Ether. Then there turned out to be three um, manuscripts, three book length manuscripts from the 80s. And on his desk, a number of poems and in his computer, a number of poems, once I figured out how to get into the computer. And one on his desk that I want to read, um, a very recent poem, it was on his desk in a folder that said current. Um, and this is called Hiroshima Triptych. So um, Scott, almost every fall, would go to Italy for a, uh, maybe 10 days or two weeks. He, there was downtime at work. I was usually working very hard teaching, and it was um, a time that he could, I, I suspect he was going there to write poems. He never said that, but uh, I think he must have been. But one year, one fall, I had a... a visiting professorship at Kyoto University. And I said, well, why don't you use that time to visit me in Kyoto? He was rather um, dubious about this. Scott was very tall and he thought he would be you know, out of place among the Japanese and nothing, he, he wouldn't find any place comfortable to sit or whatever. Um, but it turned out, I realized once I read this poem, which I didn't read until after he died, that he had a mission in going to Japan. Um, and that became clear once he kept saying, wouldn't you like to go to Hiroshima? I said, well, I'm supposed to go there later in the month to give a talk. I don't, you know, you're only going to be here a short time. And he said, well, I really, are you sure you don't want to go to Hiroshima, which was uh, quite a distance. Um, and he'd figured out that the bullet train could get him there and back in one day. So one day when I had to do something related to the professorship, um, he said, well, I'm going to go. I didn't realize how unwell he really was at that time. Uh, and uh, so it was kind of a risk to take this trip. But um, this poem reveals his, um, his intent, which I guess I'll explain a little bit. I think it'll be cl clear, but um, Scott's grandfather had died at the age of 60 of leukemia and the family believed it was because he, and likely was so that um, he'd been stationed on a naval ship um, as a pharmacist mate. I think he was, must have been in his 50s then, uh, 40s, because he had sons in the war too. Anyway, um, uh, but he arrived on the ship quite soon after the bombings and uh, they didn't understand the extent to which there were fumes and gases and horrible things that he inhaled. So it, there was some assumption that that it was that experience that that caused his father to, grandfather to uh, develop leukemia. And so I suspect that Scott mostly knew his father as, as an invalid, as he's described his grandfather as an invalid. Um, so Hiroshima triptych, one. In Kyoto, over lunch with Japanese professors, one says his uncle was a kamikaze, but the war was over before his turn. So the uncle called his remaining days an afterlife. Deep in the 13th century, a typhoon sunk a fleet of Mongol ships before they could invade Japan. According to the Buddhist samurai, this was not an ordinary storm but a kamikaze, a wind sent by the gods. And so the pilots were named together a holy wind to sweep the enemy away. Two, in late September, 45, grandpa in the Navy peered through his binoculars at the flattened ashen city. He faced a wind that carried the dust over the water and into his body, into his blood. I remember the attic room where he lay in a single bed the years he took to die, listening to the news on his radio 
an old zenith, the grill cloth flecked with red and gold, waiting for a holy wind to sweep his life away. Three, in the museum, there is the model bomb, the stunned watch stopped at 8.15, the melted glass, but nothing compares to that photograph, a lovely woman's back and shoulder bared, the crosshatch pattern of the kimono she wore, a charcoal sketched, burned into her skin. So he made the trip. Um, Lloyd, I think you're going to take us back to Italy. We're going back to Italy, back to Naples. Um, Um, yeah. The view from Parco Griffeo. Paula serves me breakfast in her Chinese silk pajamas. Coffee with steamed milk. The juice of blood oranges erupted whole from sweet volcanic soil and toast from a ribbed grill that tastes of the same sweet ash. Sweeping on her terrace, high on the Vomero Hill, she looks out at the sea and tells me whether I should sail. She says, non oggi, pointing down to a broad harbor that looks to me like merely rippled slate, not rough water. But Paola knows the sea. Or perhaps she only knows Fabrizio, her husband, took a rough ride out today to play his drums in a Capri club. What she doesn't know is soon she and I will have the same disease. Once carpeted with broccoli, this hill is named for plowshares or vomeri, implements that cut the crust of sloping fields until American and German bombs left the land good for nothing but towers of apartments built by sudden money. Still, the view remains from ground or balcony. Ferries and their feathered wakes trees that cling to cliffs out by Posilipo, islands ringed in mist. And still each day, the sun keeps potted cactuses alive on the terraces of Vomero. And still each night, Tunisian mu music throbs against the shore. Or maybe that's Fabrizio drumming in the wind. Hmm. Oh, well, I'm gonna end this section of the reading with the title poem, The Blood of San Gennaro. Um, and if you have, well, I don't want you to think about questions while I'm reading, but we'll take some questions <laughs> after I'm, I read. And uh, it's great that Lloyd read that poem because uh, you know, The Blood of San Gennaro, this was the title that Scott wanted for his chapbook. Um, and uh, I realized each, he, he tried as best he could to go to Naples in September at the time of the feast of uh, the, the Saints Day or the feast day of San Gennaro, which was September 19th, I believe. And uh, he was the patron saint of Naples, San Gennaro or Saint Gen Januarius. Um, and it was thought that in the cathedral there, there was a small glass bottle, I guess, like the glass bottle we've started with, um, the spirits ether, but this bottle holds a bit of the blood of San Gennaro and it's dried blood, but on apparently three times a year, but especially on this day, um, the Cardinal will come and 
take this vial and shake it and see if it liquefies. And this is a miracle, a miracle. It would be a, a blood miracle um, that uh, Scott liked to go and try to witness um, in the cathedral. And of course, his illness was um, a blood cancer, lymphoma, as his grandfather's leukemia was a blood cancer. And uh, although not, not related caused, don't really know how Scott had the lymphoma and ultimately his, his death was from the results of treatments for that lymphoma, uh, congestive heart failure. But um, I think he felt if he went there, you know, it would be good luck for him. And, um, and he became fascinated with all the elements of this ritual, which is um, pretty much um, what's at the heart of this poem. Um, I also thought I should tell you that uh, the blood did not liquefy at the last opportunity. So could be why we're having bad luck this year. The blood of San Gennaro. They come to the cathedral for the miracle of blood shed by San Gennaro, beheaded by pagans when the furnace refused to burn him and the lion he was fed to bowed instead. Sopped up by a follower and squeezed into a vial, the blood is most days clotted rust. But today the mayor will come, the new Camorra boss, his whore, and other dignitaries, escorted by a color guard of dapper carabinieri, the plumes of their Napoleonic hats perched like preening parrots after a tropical rain. Today, San Gennaro's blood will boil again, a sign that Mount Vesuvius will not, at least for another year. Cholera will not seep up from buried aqueducts and soccer bets will pay. After the Cardinal's invocation, the holy order of the aunts of San Gennaro, all in black cardigans, rosaries clutched, chants and begs for blessing and protection until a sudden gasp. A handkerchief is waved, the congregation claps, and then the Cardinal holds the vial high for all to see. The blood has liquefied, fresh from AD 305. The aunts begin to sing Te Deum. Bells are rung and guns are shot across the harbor from a castle's parapets. How many days we wake and wish the rust that was our blood, lost in the minor martyrdoms of our lives, could flow again. Blood that dried and stiffened the gauze of band-aids mother peeled from our knees. Blood the bullies drew from our noses. Blood of the first menses or the last surgery. Blood of the rose that melts in our dreams. Even if the latest theory calls the blood hydrated iron oxide quickly liquefied when shaken, the miracle an ancient joke. The faithful file in all afternoon to kiss the reliquary glass. Outside on Via Duomo, the street is closed for the usual carnival, blow up animals for sale, candy and roasted corn. And San Gennaro smiles from a giant poster torn and flapping in the wind. Il miracolo è fatto. The miracle is done. So thank you, Lloyd. And thank you everyone who came to listen. Don't go away because we'll take some questions and then I have a last bit to read um, to close off. So, um, we were gonna have um, Blake or Carolyn give us some questions, if any questions are, are there. Um. Um, we've got a question from Noel Baker. Megan, do you know anything about Scott's composition process? Well, I know that he um, wrote kind of sporadically. Um, and I, it used to make me a little nuts. I thought, you know, he should be writing every day. And, um, but I, it's clear to me that he was the kind of poet, um, and I don't mean to compare the results of his work to Eliz Elizabeth Bishop's, but like Elizabeth Bishop, he had these poems forming in his head, took notes, did research, 
and I think when the time came, he wrote them. Um, so it was, um, I think, a, a process of reflection. I don't have too many drafts to look at, but I know that he worked over words over and over the way one does. Um, the few drafts that I have, lots of cross outs and changes and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I, I can't say that I ever knew exactly when he was writing and, and uh, what he was doing when he was doing it. So I have to take away from this, you know, he had a, a powerful sense of vocation from the very beginning, from that time when I met him in Robert Lowell's class, he was, he was, you know, had his heart and mind set on writing and to him it was deeply meaningful as Blake said in his introduction. And though, you know, we can feel, I, but I think he just did not have that, I don't know, it's almost a muscle of that writers need to have to get their work out there. Um, he didn't have that. Um, he spent in the early years quite a while sending out manuscripts and getting rejection letters and some of them friendly, but I think at a certain point he knew he had to work to support himself and um, he would be better off spending the time that he had to write and, and living a life and developing the material that went into the poems. But I almost feel like, you know, if it weren't for that reading that Sue and Danny had brought about, I don't know what it would have happened. Somehow, all, though, all these things added up to the book coming out and it was as if, you know, if you, <laughs> he would hate that I'm using a football metaphor, but you know, you're running down the field and the uh, defenders are grabbing at you and they pull you down and you've got the ball, you just put it over the end line. And I feel like that's what this book is. We just put it over the end line and, and, and it, it got there. We have it. So I'm grateful to Aerosmith. Thanks. You seeing any more questions? Blake? Um, I'm, all right, we do have another question from Steve Yarbrough. Um, Megan, who are Scott's favorite poets? Uh, Actually, yeah. this is from- um, Oh, Eva, yes. Eva Rinowitz, Rinowitz Yarbrough. Yes, thank you, Eva. Um, yes, he loved um, Philip Levine, and I know Philip Levine was a great friend of yours. Scott felt really thrilled to sit in the front row of a reading that um, that uh, Philip Levine gave at Emerson, thanks to Steve and Eva's invitation. Oh, I'm also seeing that is the, is the book available, just the book itself. I hope in the chat there's a link to how you can acquire um, Scott's book. So anyway, Philip Levine was a great hero. Um, in college, he was able to study with Robert Lowell and he was very much influenced by him and by Frank Bedart, who came as a, a sort of substitute teacher to our class sometimes. Um, he wrote an early paper about Frank Bedart's first book, Golden State. Um, also, uh, Richard Hugo was a, a great um, influence. And um, I think those are pretty much the, the 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 three and four who who stand there for him but he he was um you know he read a lot he re he was always reading and often reading over and over the books that meant a lot to him um he'd sit in his chair and there would be Richard Hugo or Philip Levine or Robert Lowell um or Frank Bedard or some others as well and particularly as he got to know more poets um in the community here. He studied their work very carefully so that he could have intelligent conversations with them, he felt, and, and uh, be knowing about their work, Lloyds and Gales and Andrea Cohen and all those people he was lucky to get to know towards the end of his life. Um, so yes, those were his influences. And you can, I think you can see them in, um, you know, Levine's influence in his interest in the working life and Hugo and his interest in Naples and, and Lowell in the autobiographical material. Um, it's, it's really all there, but it's Scott's own use of that. So, seeing anything else? Um, um, Bob Scanlon asks if Scott ever met Seamus Heaney. 
That's a good question. Um, I, I don't, I'm sure that he didn't meet him. Um, I know, I remember myself going to the first reading, I think it was the first reading that Seamus Heaney gave at Harvard um, and the Hillis Library and what a big event that was. And I think if I had attended it, probably Scott did as well. Um, but that was just kind of after our, our time at Harvard that, that Heaney was there and such a great teacher, I understand, but we, we missed out on that. But I had Elizabeth Bishop. <laughs> um, they were passing. So. Uh, huh. oh. <laughs> Raina has a good question. Did Scott ever let you edit or help with his poems or did you get to collaborate? Um, you know, I, I uh, have a collection of letters that Scott sent to me in the summer of 1976, I guess it was. We'd had a sort of fling in the spring and, and um, I don't think either of us had intended it would go on, but um, he wrote to me over that summer and in amongst those letters was a, um, a set of poems that he'd sent me and my markings all over it in 1975. And I was so um, severe <laughs> and so wrong, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Um, so um, I didn't um, have much to do with um, these poems. He didn't show too many of them to me. Uh, sometimes I would question just the smallest thing, you know, of, punctuation or grammar or something. You know, it's funny, um, I, I, while I was working on assembling the book, um, I was part of the time at a writer's retreat in Italy, lucky me, before the pandemic. And I met there a poet named Vona Grork, who's an Irish poet. And I was talking to her about it and she said, well, what are you gonna do? You'll have to decide whether you're going to edit these poems. Are you going to revise or change or improve? And you know there wasn't anything to do. These poems were fully finished. They were they were the way they needed to be. Um, so I think that's the way he wrote. He read my own writing actually, um, and sometimes had things to say, but not. I, th I think we were both quite, you know, contained writers and and our and our good critics of ourselves. I guess we evolved that way somehow in in our unique sense um, do you do you remember anything about the poem that you that you had been so hard on oh all of them there must have been five or six poems i i you know i'm not sure i i i almost couldn't bear to look at it actually i but i'll, I'll probably look back at it someday um I, you know i thought i knew what i was doing i had taken all these poetry classes i also was a whole year older than scott so I thought I knew the world. <laughs> There's a very nice message from Bob Scanlon. Oh. About doing uh, a poet's theater event uh, built on the blood of San Gennaro. Well, that would be exciting. That would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Um, well, if there are not too many more questions, I could read a little bit more. I had a plan of reading um, just some sections from Scott's um, memoir, Getting Along in Charlestown, and following that with a, a poem that kind of settles the issues to some extent raised in this, this essay, Getting Along in Charlestown, which um, I had a hand in, actually. Raina asked about... Um, collaboration. Um, I, in the, I guess it must have been around 19, 1980 and 81, I was an assistant editor at the Boston Review. And we had started um, doing special issues. My editor, Nick Bromell, had this idea and we had great success with an issue, special issue on Vietnam, looking back from the distance of, from 1980 to, to the Vietnam War, which was now 
seems so close, but that that was very successful and was nominated for a national magazine award and special issues. So the next thing we thought was to do an uh, issue on education for fall of 1981. And I thought, I remembered that Scott had gone to Charlestown High and was very involved in um, the politics of, of Boston schools. And although he was there just before the terrible busing crisis, I thought maybe he would be someone who could write uh, um, something about, you know, looking back on that. This was 1981, the busing crisis was 1975 and 76, five years, great distance. Um, and Scott was 25 years old, writing this article, which was rejected by the Boston Review. <laughs> and um, reading it, you know, he would now and then say to me, you know, it wasn't such a bad thing that I wrote that, you know, it was kind of good for me to, it never occurred to me that he'd saved it something that he wrote in 1981, and this is now almost um, 40 years later. Um, but in amongst all the files of things there, I found it getting along in Charlestown. Uh, I also, I found my rejection letter. It was, I didn't decide, but I had to write the letter to reject it. I couldn't bear to read that either. But anyway, um, <laughs> I can't really say why the essay wasn't right then, because it now seems to have really fulfilled the assignment perfectly. But um, so I, I can't read all of it, partly because it's long, but also because there's a lot of language that we can't use. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to spoil it for those of you who haven't already read it. But I'll read some sections. Um, Scott, as I said earlier, um, uh, his his mother grew up in Charlestown. I think his father may have been from Lynn and they, his father was a sort of up and coming young man in various businesses. And they were able to move to the suburbs to Ipswich and Newton. And then when the father left, um, got returned to Charlestown about which he, you know, he had a great fondness for Charlestown but also there were hard times and some of those hard times come up in this but essentially he was writing about race and about what now we would call white supremacy and then was white supremacy too, but didn't have that name for Scott in this, in this uh, recollection, thinking back from 1981. So just bear in mind, this is 1981. Bunker Hill Monument, a 200 foot granite obelisk commemorating a revolutionary war battle marks Charlestown from miles away in any direction. Cropped on a hill of precious city grass, it faces the granite columns of the former high school and restored Victorian townhouses on the four surrounding streets of Monument Square. That's the high school that Scott and his mother and uh, his younger sister attended for a while. The younger sister under, uh, Sue, who's listening with uh, sharpshooters on the roof. Only a block downhill, however, behind the back of Colonel William Prescott's statue, sprawls a city housing project where tar, brick, and the hard faces of the poor have existed for 40 years. On the first morning of forced integration at Charlestown High School, fall 1975, those hard, white, angry faces from the project and other downhill neighborhoods appeared in Monument Square to meet the faces of the Boston Tactical Police Force, shielded by plexiglass, emotionless. That morning, the confrontation was out in the open. Later, other tactics were used. A group of black students from Philadelphia visited Bunker Hill Monument and were ambushed before they left Charlestown. Daryl Williams, a black high school football player from Jamaica Plain, standing with his team on the sideline at halftime, was paralyzed by a sniper's bullet shot from a Charlestown housing project roof. My mother grew up in Charlestown through the depression and World War II. She waited in Charlestown for her father and brothers to return from fighting in the Navy, all alive. Though one brother suffered permanent emotional damage from his experiences in the Pacific theater. My parents were married in 1950 and soon left Charlestown for the suburbs. Abandoned by her husband in 1965, my mother brought my two sisters and me back to Charlestown to find support among her family members still living there and to find work in the city, typist, 
$60 a week. My family's first apartment in Charlestown was on the second floor of a brick building around the corner from Bunker Hill Monument. The neighborhood soon cost more than we could afford. We moved to Charles Newtown, a new federally subsidized housing development built across the street from the old city project. A row of brick box family units, each with a rectangle of grass attached, stood like prefabricated miniature models of the American dream. Within a year, the cheap construction began to crumble. Vandalism and neglect soon brought the area down to its current popular name, the New Project. New or old, the projects are the last resort. You stay there proud of anything but the rooms you live in, your car, your beautiful daughter, your race. When I came to Charlestown at age 10, the city excited me. I couldn't wait to hang on a corner with a bunch of new pals. But Charlestown kids knew I was different. I didn't swagger or swear enough. I walked away from fights. I was bad at sports and didn't seem to care. I liked school. Soon I got the teasing and the beatings every faggot gets. I stayed indoors and listened to monkeys records. I couldn't figure out why they hated me. Wasn't I a regular guy? I slowly came to understand I wasn't. I had no need to greet each day with scorn, suspicion, and derisive laughter. Most kids in Charlestown, then and now, now being 1981, grow up with a static view of what's normal and see any person, place, or thing that doesn't fit as a target for attack. It's a protective strategy designed to guarantee some security, some stable sense of truth for children who grow up fatherless, poor, or in families who have made it the hard way, sweat and overtime behind a wheel, a wrench, a clipboard. A boy's worth as a human being is measured mostly on a football field or a basketball court. A girl's self-esteem stares back at her in the mirror. Anyone who strives to make it some other way is a direct threat to their fragile sense of what's right. To deprive a Charlestown kid of the familiar is to cut the only rope he's hanging from. Normal people are tough, don't read a lot, drink for fun. Normal people are white. I was white, but not normal. If my parents had never left Charlestown, I don't know if my mother's belief in the importance of a good education would have kept me from learning to fight, drink, grab girls, and skip school. It took five years of a middle-class education in the schools of Ipswich and Newton uh, to make me less or more than Charlestown's normal. My roots in Charlestown were pulled up before I was born. They could never be replanted. I didn't want them replanted. Early into adolescence, I knew I didn't want to be a regular guy. I denied what roots I had, rejected the place that rejected me. I feared the roots would catch. So uh, the next few passages are about Scott's um, rebellious time, joining uh, anti-war uh, marches and, um, and the Boston school uh, efforts on of Boston High School students to improve uh, the city schools. And um, it's great, great material, but I'm going to skip ahead um, to when he went to Harvard, the first uh, student from Charlestown High in 100 years. I, I think it was, he always thought it was because he had uh, had this experience as a rebellious writer for the school newspaper that nobody else wanted to write for. Um, I entered Harvard in 1973 and abandoned my active interest in politics and journalism to study and write poetry. Here was the safe intellectual environment I had dreamed about. I wouldn't be attacked for defending racial equality, nor presumed homosexual if I crossed my legs. Anesthetized by my newfound security, I couldn't find much to protest. While Harvard's investments in corporations supporting a racist government in South Africa agitated many of my classmates, I was content to read and worship for the first time the great poets of the 20th century. Uh, even when my black freshman roommate attempted suicide with a 22 rifle,
TV, one of the friends said, this is disgusting. Those people in Southie are sick. Why don't they just send tanks in there and blow them all away? I overheard him from my room and felt an unfamiliar sympathy for the white racists of South Boston and anger, at, not at them, but toward my roommate's friend. He didn't try to understand what the poor take pride in when their paychecks leave them ashamed. They take pride in their race, in their control of a few square miles of sub shops, bars, and three-decker houses, in their nerve to fight. Well, I want to end with um, Scott's, this is one of the poems near the end of the chapbook of poems that he intended or expected, hoped would be published. Not that he didn't hope the others would, but this, these were the ones he felt could go out into the world. And this, this looks back on that same period in his life, much of it, but um, with a gentler touch. And I think it's a better way to end on this night in the middle of calamity here. So this is called A Walk to the Next World. And uh, yeah, he's thinking of himself as a 19 year old, probably a sophomore at college, but even then he's looking back <laughs> from that, that point of view, but written in the, you know, in the last 10 years or so. A walk to the next world. It was just past dawn and I crossed the bit, bridge from the north end to city square where the river delivered itself onto the harbor, nudging the tugs and freighters awake. Charlestown waited on the other side, the old square mostly gone, drugstore, bar, printing shop boarded, and gone Johnny Shoeshine, really a bookie, squat and round in a dirty black suit, who stunk of cigars and money, smoking and counting his wad of bills, always a card game for cops in the back. I was 19, newly risen from the arms of my first older woman, and so felt full of wisdom centuries beyond my years, certain I would sidestep the follies of all the adults I knew. While this remains largely true, I will confess I was unprepared for the marriage, jobs, and cars that would fail, diseases that would succeed, and everything else that would just go on, oblivious to my will. Still, at work above my head, a night crew dismantled the L, nearly anointing my tender brow with sparks from the torches that broke it apart. Gone the sweet squeal of wheel on gleaming rail that carried me to the Renaissance fortress of the public library, where I first consumed poetry and lies. To the great marches against the first war we didn't believe in, from the common to the prudential tower, where we raised our middle fingers to shout, fuck you, Agnew, after which young communists took me to lunch and told me what I had to know about the workers, even though I was one since I worked after school for two bucks an hour at the printing shop back where we started, the Bunker Hill Press, where I collated stacks of bills of lading in carbonless copies, a miracle of the age, for Slade Gorton, the frozen fish king, to buy 45s, cures for acne, and at last an opal friendship ring that shone in the window of E.B. Horn for a seventh grade girl, not of this earth, sold in shop class, when she left me for the leader of a gang. But let's return to the dismantling, how the shadows cast by rusted girders also were dismantled, leaving the pavement dazed as an unearthed crypt, but bearing no treasure, yet safer than dodging the riveted columns running down Maine in a rambler driven by a drunken uncle. No longer scarred by the rails or their shadows, the town could move on, rents could go up, and the next world could open ahead. So thank you everyone for listening and uh, helping Scott's poems have a life in the world. And thank you Salem Athenaeum uh, for hosting this.
Um, very grateful. We'll walk to no purpose in Hawthorne, Salem, the next chance we get. <laughs> Good, definitely. Thank you so much. That was really great. And unmute and clap if you'd like to. Yeah, I asked you all to unmute. Please do. <laughs> I feel like I really learned so much about Scott. You yep. can't wait to read through all of his poems. Okay. Will everyone go out and get the book. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Blake, for a great introduction and Lloyd for wonderful readings. Uh, thank you and, um, for giving me that great yeah. chance. Yeah. And I think they're going to maybe post this as a video on the website. Is that possible? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. 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 I, I recorded in, in a within a week or so, it should be on the website and I'll email you so you know. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Yes, we have a YouTube channel. So if you're interested in seeing other things, um, you yeah. can mm -hmm. find other things that we've put up. We also have the Salem Literary Festival recordings on the Salem, on salemlitfest.org. So lots to do if we get some snow this winter and you can't even go outside for a walk. <laughs>